John Adams' Letter from the Front podcast for January 1916. This podcast looks at life in World War I through the letters of John Adams, who was 23 when he joined up in September 1914. He served with the 9th Service Battalion Royal Irish Fusiliers and was involved in many significant events on the Western Front, particularly Passchendaele. These are his words, read by his grandchildren, and narrated by his great-grandchildren. This month we have several letters from John to home, and they show the frustration that can be with the Postal Service at that time. It must have been hard to get letters to the front and from the front, considering all the activity that was happening at the time. And we find out this month that sometimes the letters didn't get home, which caused frustration with families not knowing what was happening. We also have the third part of our discussion about our trip to the Western Front in 2014. And this time we discuss the time we spent at the Somme, even though John Adams wasn't there, it was very significant to his regiment. And we also discuss what memorialising is like a hundred years later. My name's Mark Adams, and John Adams was my grandfather. The psalm is a name that echoes through Ulster Mines. A simple river in France marks the area of one of the bloodiest and futile offences in British military history. Because of his injuries from two months before, John Adams did not take part in the battle, but the cost to the 9th Service Battalion made it an important stop on the tour of the Western Front. Uh, we spent most of the day at the Somme. Uh, we went for a tour from the Ulster Tower around Thiepfel Wood, where there was an excavation of some of the trenches that were used, and you could see the trench structure. We also took upon ourselves to walk down, went past Ancra Cemetery, and found a path through the fields, and went to some of the other uh, memorials around there, the uh, Canadian and the Newfoundland memorials. Yeah, and that I, I think I think the very first thing that struck me about that mark was the was the landscape. It, it's rolling hills, it's lots of valleys. It's very like parts of Hampshire, which I, I know reasonably well. You know, you've you've got the the river Ancre itself is a bit like the River Test that flows through parts of Hampshire. The hills are chalk downland, so you know, being brought up on the Somme battlefield as a muddy summer muddy is not really the it's not really the image I got when I got there. Obviously, it was really muddy because they were digging into chalk and it became muddy and sticky and horrible, but the the, the landscape was very striking for me. And you got to see the lie, the lie of the land. I mean, I, you, you expect to have something that's just fairly flat, but it is, I mean, there's a valley in the middle of it. And I think that's where the 36th were, mainly down in the valley. Would that be right? They were on the other side of the valley, the other yeah. Side of the uh, valley. They, they, they were looking across this quite deep almost ravine-like valley, or the, the, the 9th RIF were, um, and I think the, the rest of the Ulster Division was on the other side of the Ank. But the, what struck me, like John, was the landscape and, and lines of sight, dominant positions that could be taken for machine guns and artillery and so on. And to attack across that would appear to be suicidal uh, in, in the mode of attack they would have had. You know, no air support. None of the aspects of modern warfare that make that kind of thing possible, where you start from two static positions and walking into a field of fire. And that yeah. struck me. The war was different then. The life of a soldier was expected to be spent, I think. Even from the letters in November, where he writes home and says, you know, it's only the force of, you know, the amount of men that will sacrifice themselves over here will end this war. The knowledge yeah. that they had that, yeah, that's what they were doing, sacrificing themselves. Can absolutely see that viewpoint that uh, Haig and the others and, and Granda had. Yeah, that that is interesting. There was no sort of yeah you know, the idea of preserving life and and adjusting your tactics accordingly wasn't really didn't really factor at all, did it? No. Well, I think not, it not did, the early part of the war. I think it probably did, but I think there were just there was no alternative. They, they couldn't yeah. think like that. That's why they were trying to trying out things like gas. They were trying to figure out effective ways of using aircraft, but yeah. they were too small and slow to, to be effective. It, it was a totally new warfare because 
Yeah. And what happened before was you had a line of soldiers in front of you, and you tried to get around them, have two fronts to yeah. attack them. But this line lasted from the North Sea to Switzerland. That's and there was no way you could do that, and the only way was to push. Yeah, to try and push through and uh, on, on, uh, and form what they call a salient uh, on the other side. I mean, they started this war with cavalry, for goodness sake. Well, even the Somme, the cavalry was in reserve. So the really? North Irish horse was in reserve yeah. for the expected breakthrough by the infantry. And what they so s- that they're... Their okay. tactic was to for the infantry to break through the three German lines and then for the cavalry to burst through. Obviously, they never did that infantry breakthrough. Mm-hmm. Although the Ninth Royal Irish Fusiliers did get significantly far. They they got it. We walked as far as Bowen Hamill Station, mm-hmm. which was it's actually quite a that, good that, walk. that's quite a good walk. And to do that under fire and running and yeah. you know trying to avoid being killed, they then had to withdraw. They had to withdraw because the support they, wasn't there. Yeah. Uh, and the counterattack was successful. I, as far as I read, the uh, the Ninth Service Battalion, Grandad wasn't there. He was injured before there, probably saved his life because of because six hundred men went over, five hundred and thirty two were either injured or killed. Yeah, and that's a horrendous casualty rate. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't just the thirty sixth Ulster Division. Right beside them were the twenty ninth Division, the thirty second Division, the thirty first Division. It's close to ninety percent casualty rate, isn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's where the Victoria Cross was won by uh, Lieutenant Cather. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just helping wounded, going, keeping going out and in until he was killed yes. with machine gun fire. We walked uh, around, basically across the front of the German lines, uh, from the the cemetery in that ravine, mm-hmm. and we walked around what was roughly the German front, very front line yeah. uh, along that track through the, the field, and uh, and looped around, eventually to come up into the Newfoundland Memorial, where there were still extant trenches, although much filled in, but uh, the lines of the trenches were still obvious, and, and the, the view and so on, and it wasn't very far away from yet another set of mines that we talked about. Yeah, um, there, there were still... Uh, Still signs up. You can't go here because of mines. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking of the the uh, the huge yeah. mines. You know, as in coal miner mine, mines, hundreds of tons of explosives. Mm. Very far away from those, aren't there? Yeah, I really enjoyed the tour of the trenches, the excavated trenches by the the staff at the Ulster Tower, because that was the jumping off point for many of the other men of the 36th Ulster Division. Uh, and in fact, you know, they were telling telling us about a, a body that they'd found while doing some roadworks along the, the sunken road that goes up beside the tower. That soldier was actually buried a few weeks ago with full military honours and so on. You know, just seeing the scale of the trenches, looking at what they were made of, and that was quite good in, in terms of understanding what it must have been like to be in those trenches and actually walking up and down and having the trench environment as your only environment that you knew, because you, you couldn't see that landscape, otherwise your head would be just so you were confined into these ditches, effectively, and to be able to sort of get lots and lots of men up those very narrow communication trenches that to, to do an attack was must have been quite a feat. Yes, yeah, so we were shown uh, some of the other smaller, or evidence of the smaller trenches that they dug. I can't remember what they call them, saps, I think. Yeah. Uh, where they, they would dig toward the enemy lines. They were really only as deep as you could crawl along. Mm-hmm. Um, and they found evidence of those in preparation for the, the attack on the 1st of July. 1916. Yeah. The other story we liked was where they found a spoon, didn't they? And the spoon had yeah, been that's right, yeah. punctured by a bullet and had the the service number of a soldier inscribed on it. Yeah. Um, uh, so they found that in the excavations of the trenches. Turns out this spoon belonged to a particular soldier, uh, as identified by a service number, who it had turned out was shot in the ankle. And apparently they used to get their spoons tucked on their puttees. Yeah. So uh, I thought that was quite an interesting little human mm-hmm. story. Yeah, and I managed to trace that soldier's family as well. But uh, it was a good tour. I mean, the mm. guy, uh, they, Very they, interesting. They didn't sort of sugarcoat it. They didn't sugarcoat it with, oh, this was a great offensive. I mean, the guy just basically said this was a, one of the stupidest things. Mm. They had the wrong <laughs> artillery. They had the wrong leadership. They had the wrong everything. It was poorly executed, as it turns out. <laughs> but they yeah. did learn the lessons from it, <laughs> um, and you know the whole sort of tactics in the the latter half of the war really radically changed. Yeah, costly lessons. Costly lessons. Very yeah. costly. Yeah. We went from there, from the Ulster Tower, we then went up to Thiepval Memorial, mm-hmm. the huge brick and uh, brick and stone lutins. Yes. Construction. Enormous construction. Whoa. Set in these woods. 
Again, names of soldiers whose graves are not known from the Somme. E- enormous and, and moving in quite a dominant position of the landscape. That's right. Mm-hmm. What's again interesting is the personal touch where you see the people have gone up and you know stuck a poppy beside a particular name mm-hmm. or stuff. Mm-hmm. So you know, obviously people are still remembered by the families. The First World War is now outside living history, but John, Roger and Mark discussed remembering a century-old conflict. So there's there's an interesting thing about, you know, does, as Roger was saying earlier, does that memorialisation of the war, you know, what effect does that have on succeeding generations? Does that make us think more deeply about war and about wars that our politicians are getting us into do we think differently of on, of war because of the fact that these memorials are there and have been part of our national psyche for 100 years I suspect that it does um, I was having a chat in the staff room the other day with some of my colleagues and one of the trips that Richard had been on with some kids had been to to Ypres mm-hmm. uh, and the Somme she said that it was probably the best school trip she's ever been on Mm-hmm. Um, she remembers visiting the men in gate and one of the kids uh, finding a name of a, of a relative on the gate. Yeah. Sometimes we can overemphasize that we have to remember and forget what we're remembering. One of the things I do with the young people I work with is every year now we put up the list of uh, the ones in the local war memorial and say, what names do you recognize? And try and get them to think about A, their family, and B, mm-hmm. other people around the town. And quite often these young people, you say, oh, there's your surname. Could that be a relation? And they go, I don't know. How am I meant to know? And they say, go <laughs> off and find out. Go and ask people. <laughs> Going back to what John was saying in terms of memorialising it and remembering it and doing it in the right way, I think one of the most striking things I've done in school was an assembly where I showed them a picture of Granda and told them of Granda's journey through the war, mm-hmm. um, which humanised what is a, a remarkably remote war now. Yeah. And the Falklands War is as long ago to you and I now as the Second World War was when the Falklands War was happening. Yeah, that's true. 11th January 1916, British Expeditionary Force, somewhere in France. My dear mother, just a few lines hoping this will find you and all at home in the usual good health as it leaves me in the same at present. I cannot understand how it was that you have got no letters from me as long as Annie's postcard says, for there I not a week passes that I do not write home, and there must be some mistake that you do not get them. I think this is the third letter I have written since Christmas, and Annie says that you have got none of them, but you may have got them before this. I hope that you got all right again yourself. I was very sorry to hear that you were so bad with pains but it has been a severe winter all through. But thank goodness it has cleared up at last and it's getting like spring out here now. I think it comes sooner here than in Ireland. We are on our way once more to the trenches and have arrived in a little village a short distance from the firing line, which I expect we shall be in by the time you get this. But do not be in the least alarmed as for our safety, as I do not believe the Germans have made a bullet that is to kill me yet. At least I believe that at any rate. I had a letter from Jeannie and she said also that she had a letter from you to tell her that you got no letters from me and also that she had none from me either and I do wonder where they were going. I believe Mr Chambers and Archer is leaving Hollywood to go to America and make their fortunes. It is a wonderful thing to be going to do and this terrible war going on. They will have plenty of time for that when the war is over for I think there will be a few men left after it is over the way it is going. Tell Jimmy I am sorry for anything I said in my last letter. I didn't mean all I say, but I believe I write home as often as I get. Sometimes I think you forget about me out here. You may think long not to get a letter from me, but it's worse on us here when we do not hear from home. For at home yous are all together and in a civilised world, while we are not. And only through letters can we know how things are going on at home. So do not get on to me too much when you have not got a letter from me when you know that I have written. We are still together and are with Jay McCulloch who is from Bestbrook and we had a great Christmas together. For we got all sorts of parcels, the three of us, and the way we messed together they lasted for a long time. 
I got about 12 parcels myself from all over the country. I got a great parcel from M. Morton and also from Mrs. Moody of Tandrugui where I stopped when we were on the route march. I think I was telling you about her the time I was home. I also got a great muffler from L. Morton through Mrs. Hall of Narrowwater who undertook to pay all expenses on comforts that was sent on comforts that was sent to any of the Ulster Division from Warren Point, so I was very well done for. I think I must draw to a close, hoping once again that you are all right. I am hoping to hear from you soon again. I remain your loving son, John Adams. Field Postcard, 13th January 1916 I am quite well and am going on well. I received your letter dated the 9th of January 1916. Letter follows at first opportunity. 18th January 1916. British Expeditionary Force, somewhere in France. My dear mother, I now take the pleasure of writing a few lines hoping they will find yourself and all at home in their usual good health as this leaves me in the same out here at this time of writing. I have got your parcel just now. Many thanks for the same. I had your letter the day before yesterday. Well, dear mother, you need not trouble about sending me anything out here as it costs you so much and I may tell you straight, we do not want for anything out here as we get the issue of cigarettes every week and the Mount Norris people have been good enough to forward us another issue. And then we have an army canteen in the regiment, then we get nearly anything we want. So you need not mind bothering your head about sending me anything out here. Of course, I do not want you to be angry or take anything to you of what I say. I thank you from my heart for what you have sent me out here, but you have little enough for yourself without paying the heavy postage that is on the present. I am sure that we were glad to see Jimmy when he came up. Has he much changed? Or did his wounds affect him in any way? I am sure he did not say much about the time he had. That is not the soldier's way of doing anything. I had a letter from Jeannie telling me about Mr. Chambers leaving, but I think I named it in my last letter. I am glad you are getting my letters now. I was very sorry to hear that you were not getting them, for there is a, not a week passes that I do not write home. But dear mother, do not take it so about the leave. We might land in some night before you know. They do not let anybody hear what they are doing, so do not get downhearted about it. Has Johnny Elliot come back to live at the crossroads? He doesn't stay long in one place. The weather has gotten better now and there is not many that will be sorry about that for the wet weather is not very pleasant out here. But no matter, we are well hardened to it now. We will be like tarred roofs when we get home. But you need not be uneasy about us for I think the German bullet is not made that will kill me. So do not say any more about it. What is the matter with Davy Patton? I was very afraid there some of those boys that talked so much would not stand roughing it very long out here. The wet cold weather would kill them if they ever saw a German. Yes, Lou Morton has been good to me. I would be most ungrateful to her if I would forget her for it, which I have no thoughts of doing. I think I have not much more to say tonight, only to thank you again for your parcel. So good night, and God take care of all at home until we meet again. I remain your loving son, John Adams. And please do not take ill anything I said in my last letter, as I may have been angry at the time. This is a mirror for Annie. Tell her that she must blow her breath out before she uses it and see the results. I am sorry I do not have time to write to her, but I shall do so as soon as I get the time. J. Adams Tell Annie I will write as soon as I get time, but I cannot get the time just now as I am writing to Jimmy. 27th January 1916 Stamped Past Field Sensor 2198 and countersigned D.R. Hood Postcard shows greetings from France an officer and a man from the ranks look wistfully into the distance amongst the conical tents of camp. Dear Mother, just a card to say that I received your letter yesterday all right. Glad to know that all at home are still enjoying good health as it leaves myself at the same here at present. 
I am sorry that I have not time for a letter just now, but I will do so as soon as I have time. The weather still keeps fairly good and I hope that it continues to do so. No more at present, I remain your loving son, John. Thank you for listening to John Adams' Letters from the Front podcast. To find out more about John Adams and his family, visit www.johnadams.org.uk forward slash letters. The history of the 9th Service Battalion, Royal Irish Fusiliers, during World War I is taken from Blacker's Boys. Visit them at www. Ninth Irish Fusiliers.co.uk with the number nine. Podcasts will be published 100 years after the letters were written, so will be published nearly every month. If you would like to contact us with comments or reactions, the email address is letters at johnadams.org.uk. This has been a Mark Mess production. <laughs>